Welcome to Startup TV Boston. I'm Michael McCarthy, and I'd like to welcome my guest, Satiris. Welcome. Hello. Hi, it's great to be here. Glad to have you here. Startup TV Boston is a show that I started a few years ago for my Harvard students who were studying the Entrepreneurship and Innovation class. And at the end of the semester, when they had these great startups that had wonderful ideas with lots of legs and potential, they had nowhere to go with them. I started this TV show so that they could share with us and the community in general, you the audience, what their ideas were so that you could understand what are startups and what kind of ideas are out there, as well as taking this show so that they could bring it to venture capitalists and show them the TV show and potentially get funding. I met Satirius at the MIT High School Startup Launch Program this summer. I was a coach and a judge. and. I think he might be a serial entrepreneur. Yes. I want to find that out. So Satirius, tell me, how old are you? So currently I'm 17 years old. I'm rising senior. Rising senior. And so a rising senior means you're going into your senior year in yeah, high school? into the senior year. And where are you from? I'm from Greece, Athens. Uh, basically, yeah, I've lived there. And I've visited the US like a lot of times so far. So mm -hmm. I'm familiar, familiar with the place and the language. Excellent. So when we first met, you had a startup project that I was helping coach you on, but during our time together, you have two other yes. startups. Uh, so there's this uh, one that we made at launch uh, with my company, but uh, before launch, I already had uh, two companies that I've um, built with uh, co-workers and friends from Greece. So. How old were you when you had your first startup? So the idea for the first startup uh, came when I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, basically, I had this idea and I discussed it with my sister. Um, and we decided that maybe we can make something out of it, get help from someone that um, knows more about the technical stuff that we needed. So my sister is three years older than me, and she knew a bit more. So, what, how old is your sister? So, my sister is three years older than me. She's 20 at the moment. She's 20. And what's her name? Uh, Cassie. Hi, Cassie. <laughs> so, what, tell me about the idea. How did it, how did it come about? So, basically, um, it was September of 2011, mm -hmm. and school was starting. And so, we were trying to get our books, uh, our school books, from the year that was going to come. And in the bookstores, like, we couldn't find them. Uh, they were all sold out. And we thought that the students that have already gone in the year we're going in have the school books. So in Greece, uh, the government prints out all the school books and gives it to the students for free. And so every year, every student of the same grade has the same school book. So the government prints the books. You as students have to buy the books. Uh, they come for free, uh, but you pick them up from bookstores. Okay, and all the books were sold out this year, and students from the previous year you knew had the books, but they don't need them anymore. Yeah, and like most of the times, these books end up being uh, in some shelf, uh, not used like ever, mm -hmm. or thrown away. So the problem is you're trying to find a book that you need. The people that have it, you don't know who they are or where the books are. And the problem is also that we see that the government keeps printing the same books over and over again for no reason, which is the cost is really high and it's also harmful for the environment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we want to create, let's say, a community that people that have these books uh, that can supply them uh, can meet with other people that demand them and have this book exchange. So you wanted to create a book exchange? Yeah, a uh, book exchange platform. Between or, people that needed the books and the people that know that had them but didn't need them anymore? Yes. Okay, excellent. So are, are you ready to show us your PowerPoint on this? Okay, beautiful. Take it away. Okay, so as I said, um, in many countries uh, such as Greece, the government prints uh, the school books and then distributes them to the high school students. So 
The good thing about that is that students get free books. Well, but the downside of that is that there's a high cost for the government that keeps printing the same books and the trees are being cut. Uh, this is harmful for the environment. So we want to create a pool uh, where people can reuse uh, their books and school books are only going to be printed when there is an actual uh, demand for it. So this way we keep the positives um, such as having free books but then we minimize the cost and the harm to the environment. So uh, we need to organize a community in which um, there will be people that can supply school books and people that want them. Uh, and so there, was, there will be this uh, demand and supply of fulfillment. So Book for Book is an online platform uh, for school book exchanges. Um, it allows um, people to sign in, basically uh, declare the books they have and the books that they need. So every school student um, finishes his year and he no longer needs his books from that year. He only needs the books of the year that he's going to go into. So, and then like the seniors, when they finish their school, they do not need their books anymore. And they also do not demand any other books because they're going into university. So the seniors can give away their books for free. And going down the cycle, let's say, there will be this recycling of the school books. Um, so you basically just become a member, offer your book, request another book, and you can either um, meet um, another person, in, meet someone in person that is, lives nearby and is willing to provide the book you're asking, or create uh, school book exchange events where a lot of people gather up from nearby areas and exchange books. Um, so, uh, so far we have uh, over 2,000 uh, users in our platform. Uh, over a hundred references on the web. We have uh, book for book for Sri Lanka and Cyprus. Um, and we have organized many book exchange events in Athens uh, and also uh, as book for book. And also uh, a lot of bookstores. Uh, an example is one bookstore in Crete, an island of uh, Greece, um, took initiative and created an event through our platform. And they they had this event and then all students and parents came and exchanged their school books. Uh, so we've also uh, talked about this project in TEDx, in Thessaloniki, a city of Greece, and we've won several awards. Uh, we've also been in Greek national TV uh, four times. And this is uh, book for book and you can see the information to contact us in the screen. That's a cool idea. So you, you're actually doing this? Yes, uh, people are exchanging books. So you have 2,000 users on the platform right now, and they're in Greece, Sri Lanka, and Cyprus? Yes, they're in these three countries. Now, what is the incentive for the students who have the old books that they don't need anymore to, to put them on the platform to give them away? So they don't need the books that they already have, but they're going to need uh, the books of the next year. So by providing books, they are granted that they will receive the books that they need. I see. So it's a book exchange. Yes. So I, if I want to get the books that I need, I have to give the books that I don't need to somebody else. Okay. And you have 2,000 users. Is, there, is this a... a a free service? Is there any money involved with this? Uh, it's a free service. Uh, there is no subscription fee or anything. Okay. And what kind of feedback are you getting from people who are part of the program? So, so far, uh, feedback has been great. I mean, uh, we talk to people that actually in group exchange events that we create as Book for Book, uh, we get uh, information like details from the people that come and exchange books, and we contact them later, and we ask them about their experience, 
and they all find it uh, really useful. And they see that actually the cost of printing these books um, over and over again is nonsense, basically. And tell me about the awards that you've won for this project. So throughout the years, uh, we've won, uh, should I go back? So just last year, uh, we, wa we won the first award of the Everyday Young Heroes. Uh, so, so basically, as you can see, most of our awards have to do with uh, being environmentally aware and caring about the environment, such as the Green Innovation Award in the World Summit Youth Awards a few years back. Um, and that is because, as I said before, um, the the burden that this current process of printing books puts in the environment is tremendous. Okay, and have you considered monetizing this? Have you had any thoughts about how to make money with this site? Well, uh, so far, our only idea when it comes to income uh, is through ad revenues. Mm -hmm. But our initial idea. Uh, I mean, we didn't really consider making uh, money out of this company um, aside from revenue. So it's basically like uh, volunteer work that, well, minimizes the cost of the government. And at times like current ones, uh, it is very important for a country like Greece. So is the government aware that you exist? Um, well, not that I know of. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, they haven't made any uh, public or uh, like announcements about us. No contact. Yeah. Okay. And um, what did you learn from this project? What's one thing that you learned that you weren't expecting to learn? A surprise. So. Um, so it really surprised me how people, so in the beginning, um, we thought that having uh, used books would be sort of a problem because sometimes you have notes on books mm -hmm. um, and we thought that would be a problem. But from the feedback we got, as it turns out, uh, we realized that this is a good thing because um, aside with the book, you get extra information, you get notes that previous students made and help you. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. So it's actually, it's a book with some extra information. Yeah, in it. it's, yeah. And most uh, school books, uh, and especially for higher grades, um, you, don't, you don't fill out exercises inside the book. So you just get, um, you get the exercise and then you solve it let's say, in one textbook that you have. So there's not going to be this problem of giving away answers. Mm -hmm. So that was an unexpected benefit. Yeah. Was there, was there an unexpected disappointment or a challenge that you had that you didn't see coming? Well, um, well, we, so most of the school book exchange we've made have been uh, through school, like, uh, school book exchange events that we organized as Book for Book. And we were expecting uh, more people to get, like, get the initiative and make their own uh, school book exchanges in a smaller scale, let's say just meet in person. That hasn't happened in the scale that we wanted. Um, and yeah, that was something that we didn't expect. Okay. And who's maintaining the, the, exchange, the website to make the exchange continue to work? So, uh, I mean, there really doesn't need to be any, uh, any like, too much effort put in the maintenance since, I mean, the platform, you just uh, find, you list, like, what books you want, mm -hmm. and then you find another person that can give you those books and you come to contact with them. So um, you get off the platform, let's say, once you make your exchange. 
Oh, and they just email or text each other, I'll meet you here. Yeah, or you can do it also through a chat box um, in the platform, which doesn't really require like maintenance. Like when we get problems uh, with functionality of the website uh, every, let's say about two months, mm -hmm. but they're easy to fix and don't take up much time. Okay. So you did this project, it worked, you didn't make any money at it because that wasn't the objective. So what did you get out of it? What was your satisfaction? So it was definitely uh, seeing that people are excited um, to help out uh, our government in times like this. And also that are willing to try out uh, new ways, uh, let's say, of uh, getting the school books because, I mean, for the people, the books are free. Mm -hmm. um, so why use our platform? Well, we really saw that the that when they use our platform, like they think that they and they do, uh, they are making an impact by reducing the environmental uh, damage, and that sort of inspires us to see that how much people care about. Excellent. So this was your first startup at age 11. And when did you have your second startup? How old were you? So my second startup uh, was started uh, two years ago. Uh, so I was 15 at the time. So there's a four year gap. Yeah. OK. Would you like to share with us your second startup? Of course. OK, let's begin. Um, so my second uh, startup is Best Black, Best Black Seat. So if you Google uh, board in the car, you get like 120 million results in just half a second. And that is not accidental, I tell you. So people spend around one and a half hour per day in the car uh, as drivers or passengers, and they can get really bored. So they might have the wrong company. And even worse, they cannot admit that they have the wrong company. Well, passengers think that this time spent in the car um, really lacks quality. And all available ways um, to take advantage of that time are not constructive. And they isolate the, user, the passengers from the immediate environment and the other passengers of the car. Also. Some studies have shown that this time uh, spent in the car is ideal for um, ads. And on top of that, soon, with an autonomous vehicles, um, everyone will be a passenger in the car. So what is Best Black Sea? Basically, it's an augmented reality systems, uh, system um, that allows users, passengers of vehicles, to have an undistracted view of the outside of the car without um, having the seats or the sides and the roof of the car in the way. So the system consists of one panoramic camera that is mounted on top of the car that gets a 360 view of the surrounding. And then um, a pair of VR glasses uh, that the user wears and is able to see what is outside of the car. So it basically feels like riding a bike. You don't have any walls surrounding you. You can see everything outside. And in what you see, uh, we add information. So let's say you're driving um, by a monument that you have no idea what it is. And you get an annotation that says, hey, look, this is uh, this monument and gives some basic information about it. So in order not to be isolated from the other passengers, uh, you, have, uh, you can have a video, um, a small video box that uh, shows you all the other passengers in the car. So the processing is done in real time. Um, the camera takes the video um, and it is processed through a computer in real time and then the information of the surroundings are added in. 
and then displayed to your VR headset. There's also, there can also be targeted advertisement in that augmented reality that you're in uh, while using the system. So if you drive by a burger place, you get an annotation, hey, this is, uh, it has a special offer for your, for the users of Best Backseat, you should try it out. So, so far, some initial recognition um, that we received was uh, the John and Mary Papa John uh, uh, Business Awards. It, wa it is in the ACT Anatolia School of Business in Thessaloniki. Uh, we've had a presentation in TEDx and TUA um, a few months back, and we are testing a collaboration with Taxibit, uh, which is, it's basically Uber for taxis in Greece, and it's the biggest um, taxi, let's say, taxi-related company in Greece. So our business plan uh, consists of three phases um, that last for five years. So in the beginning, we try to find we try to find. Um, strategic partnerships such as Taxibit, uh, get some feedback on our um, product and improve some features or add new features. Um, then we go on to extending these partnerships and also getting uh, real customers to use our, uh, our system and get more feedback and improve the services. And then on the third phase, just keep expanding this um, B2B and B2C customer base. So this is our team. Uh, I'm the one in the middle, uh, Stafes on the right, and Thymios on the left. Thank you. Another cool idea. <laughs> so where did this idea come from? So. Um, uh, I usually, in the car, it's me, my sister, and my mother. Mm -hmm. And because we go by like age, my mother drives, of course, and my sister sits in the front next to her. And I'm just on the back of the car alone, uh, just waiting for time to pass. Uh, and I can't really do anything in the car aside from. So it was you who was bored in the back seat. Yeah, I was bored. In the back seat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's typically how companies start. You have your own comp your own pain, and you're you're the first customer. Yeah. So you were bored in the back seat, and then, and then I started thinking of like, how can I make this not boring, right? And so at that time. Um, the virtual reality and augmented reality technology was rising, and I was really interested into that. And I started, I started thinking of how I could combine um, this augmented reality with my problem and solve it. So how, how do you operationally make it work, the panoramic camera to talk to the, the eye device? Uh, so... You mean uh, in terms of processing the... So you basically take the uh, video from the camera. Um, there are some programs that uh, turn any kind of video into ones that fit uh, the virtual reality glasses. Mm -hmm. And aside from that, we have to add uh, information uh, about the surroundings that are in your location. And we get this information from open source providers like uh, Google Maps, for example, that have, let's say, that list, let's say, all the monuments and buildings based on locations. So we take that information, we add it into that video, mm -hmm. and then we show it in the camera, in the virtual reality glasses. When you say that this is in real time, are you saying that the, the camera's on top of the, the roof of the car, you're driving and you're seeing in the virtual reality glasses while you're driving. Uh, you, 
So the user is not the driver, definitely. Understood, but yeah. while you, but yeah. while you're driving in the back seat, you see a, what is you're, you're getting a live shot. Yeah, so right. how is there enough time to put on what monument you're passing by? So um, there is um, this technology that basically, um, from where you are at one moment, the speed of your car, um, behavior from other uh, car drivers, you can predict where you're going to be in a few moments. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have some options, some possibilities of the places your car could be in the upcoming, let's say, 30 seconds. And we use that time to get in the information inside the inside the video that is shown in the glass. For example, you're driving on a highway, the next exit isn't for 20 kilometers. You know you're yeah. going to be going in that direction for the next 20 kilometers. Okay. And again, back to the, to the second part of the question is, let's say I'm, you know that down the road there's going to be this church that you want to tell me what church it is. How do you find out the name of the church and put it into the virtual reality glasses? Uh, so this is basically done by using information provided by open source providers such as like Google Maps that have all this information already. Um, I mean, if it's something too specific that does not exist in one of these open sources, we cannot really have it in the... Okay, so it's, it's basically Google Maps you're outsourcing to get that, that information. Okay. And now you're going to be adding on coupons. Yeah, we... You mean the advertising? The advertising part. Yeah. yeah, tell me about that. We basically are... We are at the moment looking at how we're going to make the advertising work um, for our service. So we want to have um, targeted advertisement based on the user so basically maybe have the user subscribe in some categories to get um, similar information let's say if the user is loves food um, we show him advertisements that are focused on restaurants cafes and so on mm -hmm. or maybe using information uh, from the car's location, like where does this user um, go usually? Like if he stops outside of a, let's say, shopping center, uh, very often uh, you get the information that he likes shopping and you give him uh, advertising that is relevant. So is this an idea or this is actually in place right now? Uh, this is an idea. So the basic idea, to make sure I understand it right, I have the glasses on, I'm in the back seat, you know that I like food, and we're driving along, and I see, oh, hamburgers, two for one if you stop in the next hour. And I go, mom, stop the car, free hamburgers. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's basically it. Okay, okay, I get that. Now, how does, in your, how do you envision that when the car is driving, that it knows that there's a coupon at this lunch at this restaurant. So uh, the coupons and the deals um, are going to be made specifically uh, for the best backseat users. So um, let's say that we come in, as best backseat come in contact with the stores, and they they say that we'll give you the special offer if you provide a customer. So we already know which stores have uh, this special coupon for the customer. Okay, so you go to a store and you say, we have a lot of people with our glasses driving past. Uh, we'd like you to give a coupon to our customers. And they say, okay, we'll give you 20% off. For our audience who might not be technologically savvy, how do you communicate as you're driving by that there's a coupon that pops up in the virtual reality glasses? Uh, you have it in the form of an annotation. Uh, just an like annotation? Uh, annotation. Annotation, okay. So um, 
basically the same way you show uh, the name of monument. Mm -hmm. Instead of having a name of a monument, you have a deal for burger. A deal for burger. Let's say two for one, twenty percent off mm -hmm. for burger. Okay, so that's that's your your coupon idea, which I like, especially if you if you. I would assume you're going to be giving these glasses to children in the back seat, and children usually get what they want because they they just nag. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So I could see them saying, you know, mommy, mommy, I want the I want the apple juice. It's on sale right now. Stop the car. I'm sure the mothers would love that. <laughs> the advertisers would because you know that's the kids usually get what they want. It, that's a very interesting idea. Now, share with me how how far along are you right now with that coming to pass? So we have um, a working demo uh, which um, needs a computer to process the video of that is taking of the surrounding. So um, in our final product, we are aiming like not having to use a computer for the processing, just your smartphone. Um, but, and we also improving the, so, we cannot get the time, uh, the real processing time, to being exactly like unnotice unnoticeable. So we have one second delay in the video that is taking and the one that is shown to the user. So we are trying to improve that, uh, the live processing um, time to bring it down. Um, well, qu that brings me a question. If, if, if you knew that I was here in the car, is there a way to have the hamburger, let's say the restaurant is, is over here, to transmit where maybe I get an ad that says, oh, take exit three and you're going to get a coupon, or oh no, take exit four and you'll get a free sweater. Is there a way that I could be within a radius of the store and it makes me change my route to get to them? Yeah, that could definitely work um, by, let's say, the same way we have the raw video of the passengers, like a small box in the bottom coming up where you can see the passengers. You can have um, boxes coming up from the top, let's say, that say that uh, if you take the exit here, you find the burger place that you're looking for uh, that has the sale. But then you want to make sure that your radius is not too big, not to fill the screen with annotations right. that are yeah, getting in the way. Like if I'm a guy, I don't want to hear uh, ads about cosmetic sales or if I'm not yeah. into cosmetics. So there could be a sorting feature. OK. The one thing that did pop in my head, it seemed, yeah, everyone has an idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I have one to share with you. When you were sharing this, I thought that this would be a really interesting thing for tour buses, where there's this set route of we know that we're going to go to, we're always going to go on this route, and you could have these virtual reality glasses, and whether I'm in the aisle or on the window, I don't have to crawl around my, my passenger to see where I'm going. And you can have multiple languages, so whatever language I, I speak. Uh, have you thought about doing tour guides? Yeah, definitely. We've thought about doing uh, tour buses. Um, so we basically have it in the same concept as uh, using a taxi or a bus, a public transportation, or a tour, uh, or a tour bus. Um, but so we were really wondering, um, we will provide, let's say, the the tour guide company, let's say, with uh, the hardware and the software that they need. And are we gonna ask, are we gonna have a, subscri a subscription fee? Or are we gonna have, let's say, a payment per passenger? Um, what is, let's say, a business model that we can show them in order to get them interested? So this is now where you're having a question of what do we, yeah. how do we monetize it? Typically what I like to look at is what are, what are, what's a similar product doing and how have they, how are they making money at it now? And I like to look at that because they've, they've dug into the business already. 
And for whatever reason, we don't know what their research came up with, they found that this is the best way to do it. Now, when I've seen products similar to this, the one that pops into mind is in Washington, D.C., we have the Smithsonian. And you can get a, it looks like a walkie-talkie. You walk into a museum and you put on your headphones and, and as you get close to the, the event, you can, it will start talking to you. Now, for those, I've seen people charge, let's say, five, six dollars to rent them while you're going through the museum. So I could see people paying, maybe just uh, swipe a credit card, it'll be a few dollars when you get on the bus and you get the, the goggles to use. That would be one way to look at it. Uh, what other thoughts have you had? What are the other things you've considered? So, yeah, the w per person payment uh, was one thing that we considered. And then also, um, let's say, having the tour guide company uh, pay us a certain amount, like a subscription fee for a month, and they can use uh, our hardware and software for unlimited, let's say, for all passengers that they have without, uh, and they decide how much they charge their passengers. So we do not charge the customer but which is the business. Well, okay. Were, were you thinking of still having the tour guide on the bus? Uh, yeah, and the, the tour bus, the tour guide bus, right? Now, if, if there was not the tour guide, and so the tour guide is, uh, provides two functions that I see. One is to talk to them and give them this information while the bus is in transit, which, and you're replacing that function with the glasses. The added benefit is you have multi multiple languages, mm -hmm. so we, you don't have that issue. And so on a certain level, this is better. You also can have a clear view of what you want to see. You don't have to crawl around your, uh, whoever you're sitting next to. If it's rainy out or snowing, you can still get a, a beautiful view of, the, of where you are. And, but you still need someone to walk you on and off the bus holding the umbrella, follow me. The bus driver could do that. So if you, if you were to not have a physical tour guide, the money that was spent on that physical tour guide could be used as money for the virtual reality goggles. And I could see that a lot of people, when they, get on, when they come on into a tour, they prefer all-inclusive pricing as opposed to, oh, well, $5 here and $3 there. You could incorporate the savings from not having a tour guide into the price of the goggles, you might want to think about a leasing, uh, a, a leasing function where a tour company, they're already dealing with, they don't really want to own anything. They, they might lease the bus and hire the bus driver when they need him. They don't actually want to own the bus or have the, the bus driver on staff uh, all the time because they can't afford it. You could do the same thing with the goggles, that we will lease you the goggles for a fee. If they break, put them in a bag, we'll, we'll fix them, and we'll always give it fresh new content, and basically the fee that they would be paying for the tour guide, they would be paying to you. And as long as that fee was less than what they were paying the tour guide, then I could see you see where that would be profitable. That would be my one thought. That would be one thought to, to do it on the tour guide side. Now, you can also do this in museums. And, well, actually, and when in a museum you're going to be seeing things, where else do you see this happening besides tour buses? So, um, we thought of um, airplanes. Yes. Um, Get the tour while you're in the plane. Um, taxis, as I said. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, like the personal vehicle of the people. Now, why do you have to see what's outside the window? And couldn't you watch a Netflix movie? Well, this is the point that, let's say if you take a long trip uh, that lasts for hours um, to a place you've never been before, you're really interested in to seeing everything that is outside. Uh, and like getting to know information about what you see. Um, and you are not isolated from either the passengers 
or what side. So just like being in the car and watching a movie all the time. First of all, it's it gets boring, mm -hmm. and you do not spend your time in a structured way. Understood. Now another thought that came to mind is if I was driving, let's say I was I was driving to a city as a tourist. As I was going there, I would probably be very interested in having the goggles on to show me uh, a movie of places that I could go when I arrive in the city or at the destination, sort of highlights where I say, hey mom, dad, let's go to the water park, or here's a really cool restaurant, or here's an interesting museum, almost like a, like a travel guide before you get there. And that would always be fixed. It, it wouldn't require the, the machinery on top. Have you considered doing almost like a, like a tourist film, like a teaser? We haven't really thought of that, but that's a really good idea. I mean, it, yeah, the problem, we don't have the problem of uh, the real-time processing and we have the like personalized information for the users since um, well they'll have to uh, set their destination I suppose. Well one thought that comes to mind I I flew to Japan to give a speech about a little over a year ago and it was somewhere around a, I think a 12 or 17 hour flight it was long and I could imagine putting these goggles on, which would be replacing the, the TV screen, which would be nice because I don't have to worry about my neighbor not wanting to see what I'm seeing. But it would be interesting to have that where I could click on, like when I went to Japan, I wanted to see uh, traditional Japanese gardens. I was interested in that. I was also interested in eating all kinds of different Japanese food. And it, it would be cool if I could have these goggles and say, okay, I'm interested in Japanese gardens and restaurants, uh, you know, local food. Uh, tell me what you have, and then a little movie starts playing, and it's telling me, okay, I'm going to be in Kyoto and Tokyo, and these are, these are our top places to go. And I could see who would pay for that would be the people who have those restaurants and the gardens. So I could see that being free to the passenger on the plane, and it's all paid for because it's, it's advertising content. Yeah. So it's basically like replacing uh, the guidebook and making it way more interactive. Well, it replaces the guidebook, but also take a look at the, the screen that's embedded in the back of the, of the airplane seat. Now you have a, a virtual reality, augmented reality goggles that are just on your seat when you arrive free, the same way you get your free blanket and pillow. And it's free to the airline. You don't have to do any repairs because if they break, you have a few spares in the back. If they break, you either throw them out or you uh, repair them. But that would be your job. And all that's going to be paid for by the advertisers who are paying to have that content made. And I could see the airline saying, sure, give us free TV. And maybe you also charge the airline money to use and pipe into your goggles if you say, well, well, we want to also have the television in there and maybe people watching you know, where we are in flight. So I could see that one being a money maker. Just take one, one big airline and ask them to be the guinea pig, perhaps one flight from, let's say, Athens to Paris and just get it figured out. So you make your Paris movie, go to your Paris advertisers, then do the same thing on the Paris to Athens flight and you get all the the bugs out, and you'll discover, wow, this great thing happened. We didn't know that we'd have this wonderful feature, and oh, gee, we thought this was gonna, this part was gonna work, and it didn't at all. So you could just get the bugs out on one flight that's constantly between city A and city B. But I could see that one being a money maker. Yeah, definitely, it's a really good idea. Cool. Now, in the the last few minutes that we have on the show, we have about 15 more minutes. Would you like to, to would you like to go to your next startup? Of course. Okay. Show it to us. So, um, the last company, uh, it's called Icavisor. So this is the company uh, I and my co-founders uh, at launch made. Uh, so basically, our mission is to connect high school students to appropriate and experienced university students and professionals. And in order to help them and give them information, and help them make some decisions when it comes to choosing a major or a career. 
So, Jane um, is a high school student in the U.S. Uh, she wants to study in a university here, but she hasn't really figured out what exactly she wants to major in and what her ending career would look like. So her counselors are really busy because they are dealing with almost 500 um, students at the same time, and they're also very expensive. So some data that we've collected is that up to 50% of uh, college students go into college undecided, and 75% of them uh, change their major in the way. And we already know that the cost of um, spending a year in a U.S. university is really high. So changing major can really burden, um, financially burden uh, the family. So we we thought that there is a need from high school students to find someone that can understand them, someone that can help them make the right decisions when it comes to picking a college major um, or a career, and then someone that can ask, answer specific questions. Um, we thought that okay, we're going to create a network of individuals from all different life stages of the professional and the educational ecosystem. And we're going to find the most suitable pairs between advisors and advisees. Uh, and we're going to give them a platform where they can have interactions in more structured and substantial manner. So the solution is to create an international and open ACA advisor network, a huge community um, of experts and appreciatives, um, and find the most suitable pairs uh, between those two. And we're going to achieve this high compatibility by using the information the users provide in their profiles, such as talents, interests, uh, majors that they've taken, subjects that they've taken, anything. And using rules and algorithms, we're gonna um, find similar prof profiles and connect uh, the right advisor to an advisee. Um, we're also gonna provide some interaction services such as collective group discussions, um, live meetings, and also uh, we're going to show life stories of individuals uh, which are basically are going to narrate the life path of someone from high school to college uh, to a first degree, to a first job and to an ending career. And in that timeline we're going to include all information that the user provides such as what he liked, what he found difficult and so other users can see that and learn from from his experience. So, so far uh, we've had um, up to 40 advisors uh, signing up uh, for our platform giving information about uh, their college, the, the major, they, uh, um, the subjects they majored, the college they went, university, high school, uh, any talents they have. Uh, they're all willing to collaborate with us and give uh, students advice. Um, we've had um, about 10 connections of people so far. Uh, one notable was that of uh, Cassie and Pana from Greece. So some feedback that we got, um, let's read the comment of Pana's. Uh, the conversation with Cassie was very useful. I got a lot of insight about a similar program in a top USA university. We had a chance to compare courses, level of difficulty, lab experience, and campus life. So Panos is a high school is a university student from Greece, um, and Cassie, my sister, um, she studies in the uh, she studies at Columbia in the U.S. So they interacted, uh, they talked uh, through Skype, and this is the feedback we got. So for our pricing model, in the beginning we are looking into uh, revenue from ads um, and also 
finding partners that are willing to create small Akavaja communities such as uh, schools and uh, alumni organizations and universities. Um, further down the line, we're looking to have a subscription fee for uh, the users. Uh, so they will subscribe in our platform and they will get, let's say, up to this many hours of uh, advising um, per week. So this is how our website looks at the moment. You have uh, logging, uh, you can sign up, you get to your profile uh, where you can see um, some basic information about uh, the user such as age, um, country, maybe what career they do, the studies they've done, awards they've won, uh, some discussions they've been part of. Um, and you can also click in one of those discussions uh, and be part of it. You can read the topic, read all the answers so far, and give your own answer. And this would be how a live meeting would work. So you see the users. Uh, there is a screen where you can um, share a video, uh, a live video, and a chat box where you can chat. So back from your profile, you can also see some um, suggested uh, users that match your profile, which you can contact and get advice from them. Uh, this is our team. Uh, so we are, we are from all over the world, but we're all passionate about um, making education uh, better. Thank you. Nice job. Now, this is actually where I met Satiris. Uh, this was the MIT High School Summer Launch Program. And it's come a long way from the beginning. This, one of the things about entrepreneurship is this was not the first idea. This was yeah. the third or fourth rendition. Yeah, so first idea was to compare online courses. Mm -hmm. uh, just like have ratings, collect ratings from other websites and have them all in one. And let's say, say based on uh, what people like, just promote different online courses. Then we thought of making um, this platform where people can get uh, tutoring by, so high school students can get tutoring from university students um, or professionals. So let's say they needed help in their homework uh, that they have, they would find someone that had experience and would help them. And at the end, we said that uh, people are actually more interested into helping uh, younger students and giving them advice, but they do not want to, let's say, solve their homework for them. So we did some uh, research and we found out that uh, actually most of the people we contacted uh, told us that they would be willing to um, mentor and advise uh, a younger student. And so we came up with this idea and then we started adding in the features of the collective group discussions, the life story, and this is our final product. Well, I like how you, you, you took care of a lot of objections that came up in the beginning. The first one being, why would someone want to sign up for the platform because there's there's two sides to it. The person getting advice, well, sure they want to they want to get advice, with, so they would easily sign up for it. But what would the incentive be for someone to give the advice? And it seems that your basic solution is people like to help each other. Yeah, definitely. And also another problem we had uh, with one of the previous ideas is so when it comes to Turing, um, you kind of have to target uh, the two markets, like the people that are getting tutored and the people that are tutoring. But with this idea, everybody is uh, a potential advisor and an advisee. So at the life stage you are in, let's say you're a university student, you, you give advice to the high school student and you get advice from the professional. 
So who, but, and the professionals, as we said, and we found out in research, are really willing to help. Yes, and if you recall, one of the, one of the challenges was, how's it gonna be paid for? If someone's gonna be giving all this good advice, a lot of these students uh, don't have the money to pay for the tutoring, and that could be a challenge between those who have and, and, and have not. And so we had that challenge. I like the fact that it's peer-to-peer, -peer, where I could be a mentor and a mentee, depending. What I would encourage you to think about, because I've, I've said this suggestion before, <laughs> and I'd like to say it again in front of millions of people, that I love the academic advice part, definitely necessary. And if you recall, there was a section I said about life advice. And you could still put that in there on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, such as, wow, I got really drunk and I'm hungover and I have a final, what do I do? Or I have uh, another student who's on my team and he wants me to cheat. And I don't want them to cheat. I don't want to say no, I don't want to say yes, but there's an academic policy that if I turn them in, which I'm supposed to do, then they get kicked out of school and I destroy their future and their career. What do I do? There's a, there's a real benefit here to having an anonymous peer-to-peer -peer life portal of what does one do? And you could put in you know, dating, substance abuse, eating disorders. And I like the fact that if it's peer-to-peer, -peer, you get out of the, the social worker and the hired psychologist. Do you think that there's a fit for that now that you have, that you have this this far along? So uh, we definitely dig in the, into consideration this option. And we thought that um, basically, what we need to do uh, at the beginning is start by something specific mm -hmm. um, and then uh, keep adding, uh, actually making surveys and according to them and research, keep adding features um, in the website, such as the one you said, like making it a bit more broad, like advice when it comes to life, not only education. And this is something that we'll definitely be doing um, in the future. What I particularly like about it is that it brings in a unique value proposition that I don't know of any competing products. I know of competing products that are doing academic advice, but academic plus anonymous life advice on a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, that I haven't heard of, which is why I like the idea because it becomes a differentiator. And it could also bring in you other ad revenue yeah. from people who are doing that, such as social workers and therapists when you need you know, more professional advice. But I love how far you've come. And, and just in our last few, well, we have about a minute left in the show, I'd, I'd love to have you back in about a year. Because if you've yeah. done three startups in this amount of time, you'll probably have four more in about a year. So I would you- I'd love to be back. Excellent. So we'll see you uh, probably, yeah, about 12 months from now. We'll contact you and Definitely. have you back, and we'll see the next three or four startups you have. So That's great. thank you for coming on the show. Thank, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Take care.